Hi, I'm Jing Jin. I'm the uh, creator of Symphonic Verses and the owner of Quantum Entanglement Publishing. You can find Symphonic Verses at symphonicverses.com, on Facebook at Symphonic Verses, Twitter and Instagram under Symphonic Verses as well. The stores, Amazon, all have the products and that's where they can uh, be purchased as, as well. And uh, you're watching Two Geeks Talking. Good morning, afternoon, evening, everyone. Two Geeks Talking is an entertainment industry interview show where we interview the creative people from the comic, film, TV, movie, and video game industries. And of course, I'm your host, Kurt Sasso. Welcome to Rapid Fire. The concept of Rapid Fire is simple. 11 questions, 9 to 15 minutes for the interview itself. And we get to talk with creative and talented people in the entertainment industry. So who is our first guest today? Is that of a comic creator, a writer, a comic that is soon to be an anime and we are joined today by the ever talented shang Zi. how are you doing today i'm good how are you doing good doing good so for those that don't know anything about yourself as a creative person tell us who you are and what you're bringing to two geeks talking uh so i am uh, Jin Jin. i own quantum entanglement publishing uh i'm also a executive producer and writer at a hollywood film studio known as the global genesis group where i have multiple of my series that have been acquired by them to come worldwide as uh, anime tv shows is it all with the same property we're talking about today or is it with multiple properties? different series i've worked on once they had acquired the first one which was uh is symphonic versus that's the first one that's coming out uh they then acquired three more of my series uh and there is actually uh, more shows that um, are going to be getting picked up uh, with uh, worldwide streaming deals. I think this is the first comic turned anime that I've actually had on the show in the past 15 years. So that's that's amazing to see. Oh, well, I like to be the first of it. That's fun. <laughs> uh, Symphonic Verses is really it's an opera, but it's a wuxia style graphic novel series and the artwork that's uh, right under the banner under where I'm at, that's how the actual artwork looks in the series. Actually, what it's about is a prince who uh, his wife has died and he finds out that there is possibly a way to bring her back to life. Uh, so he sets out to do that, but in the process, he learns that he has to make a choice, not just between good and bad, but between evil and a greater evil. So how can you do what's right when you can only do what's wrong? That's really the great dichotomy of his, his situation and, and the complexities that take the story as it moves uh, forward. And you see him falling further into darkness as this great suffering is, is going on in his life and the people who are around him. And he carries a lot of weight, all these terrible things he has suffered through in his life. Uh, so it really is a cross-section of fantasy and reality. But... It's told in a very melodic but Baroque, like Final Fantasy and Castlevania kind of esque the way that the world is in the story. What is the most misunderstood aspect about the wuxia genre? A uh, wuxia, so like wuxia. um, chi like Chinese hero stories, um, and and that's why the art looks the way that it does. It's it's not a Western style um, series by any means, and its artwork or its approach. Um, it's, it's all done from the way that I learned how to make comics uh, from China and from Korea. I think here, uh, because it's not, it's not a Western style, so publishers, they're not always so ready to accept things that are different. Now, example, you take manga, Japanese manga, very popular. Now, so many companies, they have manga, they, they have their own versions of it, their lines of it that they want to do. Wuxia is not something you see here as, as uh, prevalently as, as you do manga as far as like the mainstream uh, comics and even uh, amongst a lot of the independent comics. I think that was one of the issues when I was trying to get uh, the series published, no one would publish it because it's different. And so it got rejected. Now it, it's to 161 times. That's how many times publishers have said no because it was different, not because I was doing something wrong. And then I meet these people from the movie studio. They ask what it was before I had even self-published the first volume. They said to call them Monday at exactly three o'clock. So I call, they are like, okay, the board of directors is here, president of the film company, you have 30 seconds, pitch it to us. And so I went into it. It got quiet. I could hear them talking, but I couldn't discern what they were saying. They got back on the phone and the president of the film company said, you know what? I like it. We're going to give you a TV deal for it. 
And on top of that, we're going to give you Hollywood credits. You'll be an executive producer and lead writer on the series. A film studio said yes when 161 times publishers said no. Now there's the action figure line. There's all these things happening. So I think because it's not as well known and it's not as readily acceptable, people weren't willing to take a chance. But yet a film studio was willing to take the chance, uh, not knowing anything about it other than what I had <laughs> said to them in the, the pitch for it. That's pretty amazing because usually film studios are very gun shy about new things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's like comics, but just on a much larger scale, because if it's not something they feel that is profitable or that they can market and sell the right way, they normally will go, no, no, we're okay. But they said yes when so many other people said no. I think for me, the most amazing part is that people from places I never thought I would ever get to talk to or communicate with from HBO, Santa Monica Studio, the, some of the minds behind Game of Thrones, Square Enix, all these companies, they have told me that I'm doing the right thing with, with my IP and they've given it very kind uh, words of praise. And so it's sometimes people can't, they're not able to see the things that are right in front of them. Um, and, and that's okay, but that's why you just have to keep going. And, you know, and then here we are. Uh, that's a, that's a wonderful story, especially for those that are struggling creatively with their own IPs and their own projects here. It's the fact that you persevered through such adversity and you're seeing the, the high side of it right now. And that that's wonderful to see. Oh, well, no, thank you. I just, I, you know, just very grateful for everything that's happening. And it's funny, I didn't set out to, to do this. I didn't, I never thought I'd be working in Hollywood and having shows and all that. I, I just wanted to write my story and hope that someone liked it. And, and it felt like that maybe I did something kind of right. Here we are. And, and I'm just very grateful for, uh, for everything that's happening. What is your creative kryptonite? Time and uh, health issues when they happen. Because when you get sick, no creative person goes without having doubts. There's always, you doubt, you feel like I'm not doing good enough. I, I'm not, despite everything that can go on. So those are the things that can, can affect us, but we just have to get up and, and keep trying. What is the second wisest piece of advice that you've ever received that has stuck with you in your career? I would have to say it would be from Jason Martin, 20 some years ago, of course, when Battle Chasers was still originally in its original run. And uh, Jason Martin uh, was doing the inks uh, on that. I was at a show at the time selling black and white copies of, of Symphonic Verses. And he had a booth next to me after the show. We talked, I mean, we talked through the show, but after the show, he came over and, and we just kind of chatted it up. And he looked at what I was doing and I saw the expression on his face. And that firstly, really, that affected me because I thought, wow, he's responding to just these very crude uh, sketches and designs and things that, that I had. But then he said something to me that stuck with me. He said, keep doing this, keep doing shows. This is how you will become the next big thing. And I thought, here is a person who has worked on X-Men, Battle Chasers, a number of other properties, his own things. And yet he's telling me who at the time, because back then there was no print on demand. There were not things like there are today. So I had very crude, printed out, black and white, four by four page, stapled together and trimmed paper cutter uh, <laughs> And copies that I was selling at, uh, at a show. And he told that to me and I never forgot that. And that, that stayed with me. That still stays with me even to today. What was an early experience where you learned that language had power? Very early on between anime and things growing up in, in the eighties, being exposed to literature, fantasy and myth, all of these things that taught me very early on how Words are power, um, not just art, but the spoken and description aspect of it. It's been those experiences that 
really helped me to appreciate the importance of words, really, and, and the power that language has. What was an underappreciated anime of the 80s that people should vi- revisit today? There are so many. I know. There are so And it's funny, I, kids today can't appreciate that 25, 30 years ago, anime was not, not even all comic shops had it. You had very, you had select comic shops that had it. Not everyone. Uh, for me, it would be things like the Bubblegum Crisis, mm-hmm. Crying Freeman, R.G. Veda. Well, in 89, Record of Lotus War. The first okay. time I saw it, though, was in 1991. The original Guyver, no offense to the live act, but that's not, it's like, no, no, that, that you, can't, you can't use that as a, as a reference. Uh, AD Police, just really great things. If people go back and they they look at those, uh, they'll they'll be very surprised by the quality of, of what's there. How do you think the birth of creativity was formed? You go back to all these ancient cultures, ancient civilizations from all over the world with their own mythos, with their own religions, things that they culturally believed and some, maybe people worshipped and whatever the case may have been. Uh, the idea of being creative, I, I think it really harkens back to that, just that need for people to create things. Look at Homer, look at the time period he lived in, but clearly something in his life affected him enough that he wrote these great uh, heroic tales, the Iliad, the Odyssey, something went on. Look at William Shakespeare and, and the time frame he lived in with the contemporaries he had something went on in his life that made him want to tell these these tales the way he did so or something he experienced so i I think that is a great part of it and it helps people to deal with things it's like symphonic verses there is an element to it where it's written to help people who suffer from ptsd and from depression and from anxiety because for so long the idea of mental health was very stigmatized and not so many positive ways. People need to be able to see that it's okay that you are dealing with things, that you are suffering with things. You can learn to get help to make better choices if, if you're having those kind of perplexing situations that, that are happening. And so when readers look at Adonis and they look at his life, the choices that he's making, he's making bad choices that are leading him down a path that is extremely destructive. There again, it harkens on that idea of reality and fantasy and and how they intertwine with each other uh, throughout the tale. What did you first create that made you realize, yes, I could do this as a career? I wanted to do it professionally. Did I think I would ever get to do that? No. As I started working on this series, and I I mean, I've spent 30 years of my life Hmm. creating, writing, drawing, designing this world, every interconnecting part of it. It wasn't really until the first volume was published and it came out, the response from people was absolutely mind-blowing. I never thought people would respond to that. It's very difficult to take something that is completely unknown with characters no one knows and to get people to believe in it. If you say Batman, if you say Superman, if you say Doctor Strange, people know what you're talking about. But to name people that no one else had had really any interaction with at all, but yet they were so compelled by what they saw and the things that they heard, it moved them to purchase it and then become fans and then purchase the next volume and then purchase the next. Did I think I would ever have this happen? No, not at all. I'm just grateful that it's what I get to do. And I really am very fortunate. And I, I just appreciate the people who, who do believe because it's not about me, it's about them. Them believing in it turns it into something different. And then I just get to share that experience with them. Everyone has one person that inspired them on their path to where they are today. Who was that for you? I would say Tetsuyu Nomura, the man's yeah. a genius, literally. He really is. (laughs) He is the keeper of all things Final Fantasy. That's why Square Enix, even though it's a whole company and he is one individual and there are many talented individuals there, but they need him. It's in his DNA 
And you see that in great artists. Look at Hideo Kojima, just Hong Tae Kim, Andy Sato, Wing Ching Ma, Joe Moderera. It's something inside of them that enables them to do what they do. And it's just amazing. From a professional standpoint, you, of course, have created this amazing series over the past 30 years. You've created other works as well, too, that I'm sure you'll have to come back on to talk about in the future. And, of course, these series have been picked up by Hollywood currently and are becoming anime as well as other works, I'm sure. So professionally, you're successful in that regard. Do you consider yourself personally successful? I do in the sense that... um you know, the things that are important in life and that matter are the things that I have. Um, you know, work is work. Work is fun. Um, but it, it's it's the other things that that matter most, family and, and the fact that, you know, I've woken up another day. Um, and so uh, those, those are the things that uh, I count myself as being very fortunate, very successful to, to have that. The reverse of success is failure. How do you deal with your failures? Failure, setbacks, they are all part of the game. Personally, professionally, I think about Henry Ford, where he just said, you know, failure uh, gives us the chance to start again more intelligently. Uh, and it happens. There are going to be setbacks, mistakes, things are going to go wrong. So it's like, okay, let me take away what I've learned from what, what happened and what didn't work and what did work. And then you just try again. The younger generation is looking at your work and they're becoming inspired. How can they inspire the generation that follows them? By doing the things that everyone who has come before us has done and who is here now. Stay creative. Be bold. Be daring. Uh, dream. Don't hold that back. Don't limit yourself, whether other people understand it or not. Uh, if you have a vision, you have a story to tell, share that with people. Encourage them to, to dream and to be willing to take that step because it takes more courage to try to put yourself out there again and again and again amongst the rejections and the setbacks and the things that can happen. So keep being creative. Um, and that, that really is, uh, that's the key to it. If your life was an anime or a manga, what would its title be? And because uh, we definitely have, I'm sure, the same taste of music, thanks to Final Fantasy as well, too. What would its soundtrack be? Mm. If my life was an anime, I think it would be a mixture of a few things. Definitely Final Fantasy, Castlevania, that record of Logos War would sound like Castlevania and like Final Fantasy. Um, so many animes have such great, great, great soundtracks. Yeah. Um, as far as a title, I don't know, something dramatic. I don't know if that would be right offhand. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I thank you so much for coming on the show. I do greatly appreciate it. Oh, no, thank you. I, this has been fun. Uh, thank you for for having me on, you know, that we could talk. I always like to share my experience just to try to encourage people, no matter how it looks, how bleak it looks, how many things seem like they're going wrong, just keep going. Don't give up. Believe in your product. Believe in your IP. Because somewhere, someday, someone is going to take notice of what you're doing and it's going to help change your life forever. So just keep being creative. Uh, that's the most important thing. Where can we find you and how can we support you, of course, online and on the internet? And where can we find your amazing series? Oh, thank you. So um, you can go to symphonicverses.com. Uh, There's a store there uh, where the books can be purchased. Uh, it's also on Amazon. Type in Symphonic Verses in Google. The IMBD, the Wikipedia, everything just comes right up uh, right there. Uh, but those are the main two places you can order books uh, is from the website and from Amazon. Well, like I said, that is this particular episode of Two Geeks Talking. You, you can, of course, find this interview and a thousand plus others on our website, tgtmedia.com or twogeekstalking.com. And, of course, on our YouTube channel, which is a little more updated than our website, uh, which is youtube.com forward slash tgtmedia. And as I say every week, everyone has a story to tell. It's up to me to help bring that out. Thanks for listening watching on Two Geeks Talk.